on this episode of the All-American Legacy Podcast. This is why you're here. Look at what man is capable of doing to other men. We need to stop this. We need to make sure this never happens again. They started throwing bricks at us. One of my friends, and he got hit right in the mouth with brick, knocked out all the teeth. It was this juxtaposition of mission and good old Americans meeting these people from almost another century to them. This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe. This is the All-American Legacy Podcast. No! No! An inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are all American all the way. This is Joe Bacino with the All-American Legacy Podcast. This is the first of a two-part series on the division's 1999 deployment to Kosovo. There's an awful lot of material we uncover here about this mission, so we decided to create two episodes. Episodes 32 and 33, parts 1 and 2 of A Violent, Complicated Place, Success and Tragedy in Kosovo, and release them both on Tuesday, September 5th. The Kosovo mission has largely been forgotten and papered over by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the entire world was watching the 82nd Airborne Division in 1999. We are fortunate in that there are many All-American veterans from Kosovo still around and willing to tell their stories, and we wanted to give them voice on these shows. So, these two episodes contain almost no narration. These are the real stories of the paratroopers who served in Kosovo in their own words. My fellow Americans, today our armed forces joined our NATO allies in airstrikes against Serbian forces responsible for the brutality in Kosovo. We have acted with resolve for several reasons. My name is Eric Margulies, and I'm an expert specialized in Balkan and East European political, historical, and military affairs. It's a long, complicated story, but it begins during the First and Second Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913 that were before World so War I. Uh, the Balkans was in turmoil, was Turkish like control of the area was collapsing, um, the states that emerged rule, uh, notably Serbia, but also Bulgaria, were trying to grab as much territory as they could. And at the end of this period, the area that had been Turkish Kosovo, or Kosovo in Albanian, uh, was occupied by Serbia, which claimed that it was part of its territorial heritage and its birthplace of the Serb nation. Well, this was in the 1300s, so these claims go way, way back. But the Serbs claimed it just before World War I, so 1912, 1913, and they ethnically cleansed a lot of the population, which was Albanian, ethnic Albanian, and Muslims and Catholics, Serbs being Orthodox. So Kosovo became part of the Serbian state that was formed in the World War I. And its population, 90%, 95% ethnic Albanian, were always restive and were always against the Serbs. Serbs hated the Albanians. They called them Turks, which Albanians are definitely not Turks. But uh, there was hatred on religious grounds and on historic grounds. And this seething hatred degenerated into actual conflicts, violence in the province. And this led up to eventually, during the years of the Clinton administration, to the Serbs finally declaring that they were going to reoccupy Kosovo, take back their land. By now, the Yugoslav Federation created at the end of World War I had broken up and Serbia had gone independent, and its nationalist leaders, led by Slobodan Milosevic, announced that they were going to unify all the Serbian people in the Balkans, meaning in Slovenia and in Kosovo and Macedonia, and drive out or some of the ethnic Albanians. And this process began leading to the awful Balkan Wars at the end of the 1990s. It's the most humiliating thing that could happen to a human being, being expelled from its own land. Uh, how is it like? It's Schindler's List. Whoever saw the movie, it's exactly that feeling. The level of atrocities was egregious. 
It was really, it was unprecedented since World War II that we started seeing these awful massacres, tortures, concentration camps. It was really an ugly flashback to the 1940s. But this is a humanitarian crisis caused by political thuggery and savage militarism. The evidence is plain to see. What we've seen and heard on this side of the border is grim enough. Imagine then what it must be like inside Kosovo. Nothing less, it seems, than the planned systematic destruction of a people. The worst part began when the Serbs began driving out uh, Albanian residents in midwinter into the cold, driving them out into the woods, and they were almost a million people were being ethnically cleansed at that point. Finally, the United States stepped in and said, stop, no more, you can't do this, and the U.S. and NATO finally told the Serbs, who were being led by extreme leaders that uh, you've got to stop or we're going to intervene militarily, and that's what happened. I'm Lieutenant General Joe Anderson, currently the Deputy Chief of Staff, Headquarters Department of the Army, G357. I was Commander of 2nd Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division. The battalion was prepared for any type of mission because we had just assumed the DRF-1, the Division Ready Force 1 Battalion, that, that weekend prior to getting notification of going. We were specifically trained for full-spectrum because the battalion had a very unique opportunity of having two back-to-back -back joint readiness training center rotations at Fort Polk, Louisiana. One was in October of 97, and then a very quick year later, in November of 98, the battalion went back again. We had a, a lot of stability, a lot of experience, and had been putting through lots of the wickets, obviously, to do two back-to-back -back combat training center rotations in honor about a year, and then having another training cycle at the turn of the year to be able to deploy in the spring of 99. This kind of operation, we used to call it a police operation back in the 50s. Very demanding on the soldiers because there's just no front line, there's no evidence, clear enemy, alliances shift, there are ambushes, bombings, the civilian population hates you. I've covered many of these third world wars, let's say in Afghanistan and across the Middle East. Soldiers shouldn't be put into these situations. My name is Charles Foster. I was deployed to Kosovo in 2000. Eric Strauss. When I deployed to Kosovo, I was a Sergeant E5 team leader with Charlie Company 307th Engineers, and we were directly attached to 2505. My name is David Harvey. My position at the time was Battery Executive Officer for Charlie Battery, 3rd Battalion, 319. 19th Airborne Field Artillery Regiment, which is part of the 82nd Airborne Division, and we deployed with Task Force 3504 to Kosovo in September of 1999. Christopher Clark, I was an uh, infantryman with Charlie Company 3504. I was a saw gunner at the time. My name is Chris Adams. I was a lieutenant in the 82nd Airborne Division Artillery. I deployed to Albania and Kosovo with the 82nd Airborne Division in 1999. During that time, we did helicopter air assaults with Chinook helicopters and artillery pieces to help the Air Force. And then we transitioned into a peacekeeping mission within Kosovo. The minute we went on to worldwide deployment status, we got the call to deploy to Albania and Kosovo. We had just trained for a month straight to be prepared to deploy anywhere in the world for no notice deployment so our paratroopers were ready for any mission that came down the pipeline basically within a day or two of being put on deployment status we were called and within about a month the whole unit had deployed to Toronto Albania Initially, when we went into Kosovo, our main mission was basically to separate the warring factions in Kosovo. You had the Serb paramilitary, you had the Albanian paramilitary, and basically our mission was to implement the UN peacekeeping agreement, uh, tell people to stop shooting each other, stop laying landmines, stop shooting mortar rounds. We were collecting weapons, we were identifying mass graves. It really was a deployment where our sergeants and our paratroopers really showed their resilience and their flexibility. Because every day the mission changed. Guys in my unit went from being artillerymen to being military policemen to being civil affairs all in one deployment. And with no training, 
stateside, they basically had to learn a job on the fly and get it done. And like the 82nd always does, they found a way to get it done. My name is Jeffrey Rue. I was, at the time that I was deployed, I was a specialist. I was an 11 Bravo, which encompasses many job descriptions. Um, but before deploying, I was actually assigned to the ops section of my company, and that was Bravo Company 3rd Battalion, 504. Bond Steel was a hill when we first got there, and they built up a section of tents, and then later those became sea huts, which had running water and hot showers and all that fun stuff. And then now I believe it's, it's a full-on base. They have Starbucks, I've heard. <laughs> we got notified of our coastal deployment just uh, about 30 days before going. And so in a pre-9-11 world, when there was no Iraq, there was no Afghanistan, there was no war in the foreseeable future, Kosovo was building up this, you know, warrior mentality that we had been taught all that time. And so we prepared to go into the stuff, or whatever you want to call it. So we're going to ranges, we're, we're zeroing our weapons, we're getting extra equipment that we never had before, we're getting extra lasers and PAC-4s and PAC-2s and all these fun stuff. And so the build-up to the deployment was actually probably detrimental to the conduct that we later would display on deployment. So we get notified and we finally deploy in September 1999 and we go... And we're expecting, effectively, a war zone. But the problem was it wasn't actually a war. They didn't want to fight us. They wanted to fight each other. The Serbs and the ethnic Albanian insurgents were fighting each other in a horrendous tit-for-tat battle of attrition. So we get there. We're the most heavily armed things they've ever seen in their life. And we got to take kids to school. We we're expecting war. You know, we're expecting a threat eminent environment. So we roll into Macedonia, Cap Abel Century, and then we get on these Chinooks, and they're, everybody's yelling and screaming like, all right, we're going, we're going to Kosovo, let's go. So we go, and there's Apaches that are flying next to us, you know, and you're really, you really feel like, okay, <laughs> like this is what I've been waiting for my whole career. Yeah, I've been in the Army four years at this time. You know, this is what all this training has led up to. You know, here we are, we're in the shit. This is Nam, like we're going to do this. And we land actually in Jelani, Kosovo, not Kambonsteel yet. Kambonsteel wasn't a thing. And the Apaches are roving around us, and we're jumping off the helicopter as if we're being shot at. Squad leaders are yelling, you know, go, go, go. We're like getting down on a knee, you know. And never mind, we're in the middle of a city. <laughs> you know, there's no threat, but yet we don't know that. So we're acting and reacting to our environment. They're going to build this really big base, and we need this land secured. And at the time, they didn't know what they were going to call it. It would later be called Camp Bond Steel. And so they deployed everybody onto what was really funny was they were Ukrainian helicopters. So these big, you know, MI-8 hips or whatever they're called, hoplites, whatever the cargo helicopter of the Ukrainian army, was primary Soviet bloc equipment, they flew in to Jelani, landed, and took us away. And so we're thinking, oh, man, is this hill occupied? Like, is this going to be a Hill 338 situation or what's going on? And obviously there was nobody there. It was pure grass or bizarrely few trees in Kosovo. People have lived there for 10,000 years. They've cut down all the trees. And we land, we fan out, we start building different, I don't want to call them perimeters, but that's what they were. And then later on, follow-on forces came. They start building little bunkers. And then those bunkers later gave way to big buildings. And then those big buildings gave way to massive tent city. And then the infrastructure that's involved with that you know, you got to have power. You've got to have, I mean, those company commanders, boy, they better be on email. So you've got to get satellite up. You've got to get water up. You've got to get defecation facilities up. So Camp Bon Steel, when we landed there, was a hill. And we turned it into this massive, I've actually seen pictures lately of it, this massive installation, including airstrips and whatnot. My name is Carl Vitt. Now I'm with Time Magazine in New York City as an editor-at-large, but in 1999, I was in Kosovo for the Washington Post. I was a foreign correspondent from the Post based in Africa, but sent up to the Balkans because we were at war there. And I ended up reporting with the Americans and, and hanging out with Airborne when they came in after the Serbs left, but before the UN arrived. And the 82nd was sort of like the force on the ground there. It was just really striking to see, to say nation building is such a... You know, George Bush ran against the idea of nation building, George W., and politically fraught word, but the mission of the 82nd in Kosovo was, at night, they were running around in helicopters, 
and landing in the LZs where a building was burning and they were trying to catch an arsonist because these tank Albanians were coming to burn out the Serbs who remained behind. And then they'd move around in Humvees doing sort of the same thing, basically, you know, police enforcement, but also against uh, any armed groups that were that lingered. And, and then in the morning, going down to City Hall, and there was like a GI, and he took his helmet off and hung it on a hat rack in an office, took a seat behind the desk and the battle rattle for all I remember, and then entertained citizens, Albanians who would come in and sit down and, and complain about something that had happened. He was basically a bureaucrat. And he was this 19-year-old kid with like listening, and, and the, the guy would finish talking, and he'd say, outstanding. <laughs> it, was, it was this juxtaposition of not only of, of mission, this sort of duality of the mission, but the juxtaposition of the, to me, was a really charming one of like good hearted Americans abroad in the world and meeting these people from almost another century to them, you know. The other piece of it was that they were welcomed because the serfs had been the, the bad guys, but they'd also been the minority there. And they had mostly left, were left mostly with these people who were regarding you as liberators. I just remember a scene where in a little town and a couple of Americans had gone down to the corner to buy, I remember it was a liter of Coke <laughs> and some chips or something. And we're coming back, and it was this old ethnic Albanian guy, and you knew he's Albanian. He wore this sort of like towering, it's like a half an eggshell on your head. It's just the old men wear them. And he, you know, he sort of like tucked these guys in, came in and kissed them both on the cheek. <laughs> kids are not used to being kissed by men. <laughs> and they just said, okay, <laughs> whatever floats your boat. And it was, I don't know, I just find it all quite charming, because this is the time when American NATO, but mostly American military firepower had come in to the rescue of a Muslim population. And they were welcomed as liberators and heroes. It was just so much different than what would happen in Iraq and Afghanistan over the next 15, 18 years. My name is Joshua H. Bernier. I served in Bravo Company, 3rd Battalion, 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division. I was a radio telephone operator and a light machine gunner. My overall mission of my company when I arrived in Kosovo was peaceful security operations for the, the Kosovo people. It was kind of broad in that sense. Our mission would sometimes entail escorting kids to schools that had been persecuted based on their religion. And at other times it would be building to building searches for weapons. There was no security apparatus. I mean, there was no such thing as a policeman. So trying to get some form of governance back together again and we established a civil military operations center. That's where people could come in and turn in their complaints or make their claims or, or ask questions or figure out. We hit the airwaves, principally radio. We did use civil affairs folks. We did use loudspeakers to announce things, but through presence patrols, through checkpoints, through being broken out into really, really small elements to spread ourselves from Sturpje all the way out west, where there's actually a ski slope, all the way to Yerosovek and further east to the Denali. We were spread about as thin as you could be and trying to make sure that we had places to go, provide assistance, and try to see how Pristina was going to handle all that and how things were going to get put back together. And oh, by the way, there was a blacklist of war criminals. That's why you did random checkpoints and screening and searches and everything else, trying to find out where these blacklist folks, what they were doing and where they were living. It was fairly complicated. And, and then from random time to time, we, we would receive some really odd orders, like go to a specific part of the village that we lived in and look for weapons, or other times it was, hey, local farmer's having a problem. His cows keep stepping on all these mines that are out in this field, and uh, he doesn't want them to get blown up, so could you guys go round up the, the cows? And so we kind of became cowboys for, for a hot minute. So we were stationed in the city of Yurosovic, Kosovo, and our firing battery was tasked with protecting the very few Serbs that were left, mostly very elderly women and men that they just couldn't, they're too old to move. And so two of the women that we protected were very elderly women. And the stories that I have is they would invite us in, have uh, Turkish coffee, which the Turkish coffee was these small little cups, very caffeinated. And when you drank it, it was, you had, you saw the leaves of the caffeine of the coffee grinds and little pastries. And I was just always amazed at you know the kindness of the Serbs and then also the kindness of the Albanians with us. But then I would contrast that when you would see an Albanian and a Serb talk to one another, that whole dynamic would change. 
but I was just struck by the kindness of the people towards us as they saw we were there to help them out in their country. I think the thing that stood out for me the most was the kids. They were so helpful for us. We didn't have translators. You know, as uh, we deployed with like one translator per, I think, company. And so as a slice unit of engineers, we didn't have translators. And there was this one young, he was a nine-year-old boy, and he would come to our traffic control checkpoint all the time. And we would tell him to go away, and he just didn't care. He would just come back again and again and again. And his mom would come, and she asked us if it was okay. And I told her, I'm like, look, I'm not going to physically hurt this kid to get him to leave, but, you know, he's you know kind of at risk being here. And all he wanted to do was help and make his neighborhood better. And he was out there every day, and he was a better interpreter than I had in Iraq from paid interpreters. The kid was awesome. He spoke like six languages, and he was nine years old. He's an amazing little kid. The kids were awesome, very energetic, very happy to see us, millions of questions. You know, you got to remember this time in, in 1999, you know, the Internet was like barely, barely starting, you know, so very few people had it. I didn't even have an email address at the time. I didn't even know, probably didn't even knew what that was then. So, you know, up there in the mountains, they were very oblivious to outside news and media, and they only knew what was going on in their regional areas. So every time we would patrol with these kids, either when we were escorting them to school, or we would sit down with families in the home, conduct a little intelligence gathering, a little uh, peacekeeping, hanging out and talking with them. They would always ask us a million questions about, you know, what's America like and, and what's going on with the war right now. You know, very inquisitive, very open. This is Brendan Walsh. I deployed to Kosovo in 1999 with the 82nd Airborne Division. I do remember this one little girl who lived there, and she ended up losing her parents to a uh, you know, traumatic incident with the Serbian paramilitary who were operating in that area. She ended up witnessing the death, and she used to love the American soldiers. At first, she was a little timid of us. I think what happened was, with soldiers being in her neighborhood, it wasn't a good thing. But once we came in, and like I said, we, we kind of won the we won the population over, she befriended us. You know, we were giving her stuff and everything like that. The day we left, it, it was heartbreaking for her, because we ended up, politics got involved, and we ended up turning the town over to the Russians, who were more pro-Serbian than pro-Albanian, much more so. And when she left, she ended up handing us a picture. And on the back, it said, thank you for freedom. So uh, that was just something that I always remembered. We would go into villages and we'd search houses for weapons. Or we had one or two interpreters that spoke Albanian and Serbian. That was one of the biggest challenges was we didn't really have a lot of interpreters. At one point, I was trying to use high school German because I learned that that was a language that everybody kind of understood over there. So I used that from time to time to try and get information out of folks. We would go into houses, we would basically ask them where are the guns, and they'd show you a box of AK-47s and a box of hand grenades. I still have a picture where one of our squads found a, a Thompson submachine gun still in the packing grease from World War II that basically we were collecting. Anything from Grandpa's shotgun to a brand new AK or World War II Russian machine gun, Thompson's landmines. We basically learned that the Kosovar alarm system consisted of a plastic Russian landmine, so you had to really watch where you walk and find out where those were and make sure that people knew where not to walk. One of the stories that I wanted to tell was really highlighting the heroism of two of the soldiers in Charlie Battery. Star First Class, Antonio Murguia, who was our chief of firing battery, also known as the smoke of the firing battery, and then specialist Christopher Burpee, who was one of the advanced party men for the howitzer section. The two of them came upon an Albanian boy who had been injured by an unexploded cluster munition. And so at great risk to themselves, they went into that field, which had other unexploded ordnance. They were able to safely secure the boy, get him back to Camp Bonsteel, which is the large U.S. military facility, and were able to save his life. And after the deployment, both Starfers Class Mergia and Specialist Burpee were awarded soldiers medals for their valor in this uh, circumstance. At the time, I was, as the executive officer, I was not there on site, but I was in our battery headquarters listening to the radio call and talking to them over the radio. And it was actually the logbook that I kept, the 1594, that we then were able to submit as part of the soldiers' medal packet that demonstrated their bravery. We actually got to see some of the things that the Serbian army was doing to what they called insurgents. 
like we saw one of their torture rooms that was in there. That was, that was one thing that said, oh, man, we're really here to do something. Like something went on that we need to help stop. So that gave us an effective, you know, like a modus operandi, like what are we here to do? Our battalion commander's name was Colonel Mike Ellerby. General Commander McNeil called him Popeye Ellerby, which is funny. He called him that because of his big-ass arms. The dude was a Golden Gloves boxer at West Point, on and on. So when General McNeil later visited us, he called him Popeye. That was really funny. But anyway, he took all the leaders, including Colonel Ellerby, around to these facilities, and he showed him that room. And he then later got all of us, every single one of us that was about 130 guys, and took us in there and said, hey, this is why you're here. Uh, Like, look at what man is capable of doing to other men. We need to stop this. We need to make sure this never happens again. And he tried to link that to the last time that the 82nd Airborne was in Europe. And if you think about that for a second, imagine how hard that hit if you're an educated man. Imagine how hard that hits you as a young paratrooper. The last time the 82nd was in Europe, we were killing Nazis because they were doing something like this. And here they are doing it again. And guess who they called? They called us. At the time when we were looking for the mass grave patrols, we would go off of our S2 intelligence cell and they would give us info on areas after talking with locals and observing media traffic where they thought there might be some mass graves. So we went to a wooded area, about three and a half clicks, and you got to remember, our church on Latinica was really close to the Serbian border, so it was really common in that area because they could bounce back and forth on both sides without having to deal with the United States Air Force bomb on them. That they would hit a village, kill some people, bury the bodies, and then move out. So anyway, we moved out to this point, this grid that we got, and we didn't find anything there. And so we started to conduct cloverleaf operations in a circular pattern, and we eventually got out to about an additional click outside of the zone that we were searching. And we had found some tilled-up dirt in an area that trees hadn't been removed, and so there was obviously no farming was going on. So at that point, we brought in an EOD team, and they had a ground-penetrating radar, and they checked it out, and they said there was something odd in there. So at that point, we just pulled out our entrenching tools out of our rucksacks, and we started digging. We began to find a lot of clothing. We found a lot of documents. I would guess that was one of the things that I remember to this day. We found some passports, so we were obviously collecting and bagging all this up. And then at some point, you know, my platoon leader at the time said, hey, we need to stop. This is a crime scene. So at that point, we stopped. They brought in some uh, NATO police officers, and then they took over the investigation after that. There were bones in there. This was a much earlier grave. We had gotten there in, this was in late 99, I want to say like right around Christmas time of December of 1999, and they had guessed that at the time frame, this was, it was probably the early part of the year in which these were buried, maybe even the year prior. So it, it kind of smelled kind of ripe, and then we started seeing random body parts in various stages of decay. That's when we stopped digging. It's a couple of days before Thanksgiving, and word gets around that President Clinton's going to visit. And obviously, he's not going to come alone. So everybody gets word, clear your guard shifts, do what you got to do. Obviously, some people can't. They're not going to get off work. They're going to do it at the movie theater at Camp Bonsteel. We all filed into the theater. And me kind of being a little bit more aware than most of the other guys, I knew that I was going to have to be the front of the line in order to see the president effectively and hopefully get a picture. This is the pre-cell phone world. So this was the disposable Kodak and whoever happened to have a video camera, which I was lucky that the guy next to me had a video camera. And in they come, and Chelsea is behind me making her way up one side, and Bill and Madeline Albright and a few of his entourage are making their way through uh, to my left. And I notice he's wearing a fly jacket. This is what makes this funny. He's wearing like a little flight jacket, and it's got the division patch of the 1st Infantry Division, big red one. And I'm like, do you know the 82nd is here? Like, what? And I look over to the guy next to me who's not 82nd, and I said, I'm going to ask him why he's not wearing this patch. And I showed him mine. He goes, you're not going to ask him that. That's the president. I said, watch me. So sure enough, he makes his way through from my left to my right. He's coming towards me. I said, I'm going to ask him. You just watch. And then Chelsea has already made her way in front of me. So Chelsea Clinton is actually speaking to me. And she's like, hey, how are you? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. She goes, what do you mean, just okay? I'm like, oh, I don't know. This is amazing. And I'm a freaking dork. What do I, what do I know about president and, and people? And so finally Bill and Chelsea are right in front of me, and he's shaking everyone's hand. He finally looks at me like he wants to shake my hand. I turn my left shoulder towards him to show him my 82nd patch, and I say to him, where's your 82nd patch, sir, And as he shakes my hand? And because I turned my shoulder towards him, it was one of those, like, buddy hug type moments. He goes, oh, yeah, I like that. And he turned and he put his arm around my shoulder. And then, of course, all the cameras behind us flash at, at the same time. And he's reading his speech. He's going to name all the units. You guys have moved this much dirt. You guys have built this many buildings. You guys have done this. We want to thank the first air defense guys. We want to thank the third commo guys. But then he gets to us. 
And he goes, the Blue Devils of the 3rd Battalion, 5th and 4th, 3rd Shoot Infantry Regiment, and we blow the roof off, of course, with cheering. But then he stops and he laughs. This is the President of the United States. He laughs. And he's like, <laughs> for the press, I want them to know that the Blue Devils of the 3rd Battalion of the 5th and 4th, 3rd Shoot Infantry Regiment are known as the Devils in Baggy Pants. And let me tell you, we screamed as loud as I've ever screamed airborne in my life. We blew the roof off that building. And, of course, he continued with his speech and read the rest of the units. But it was clearly known that the 82nd was in the house. And we weren't the biggest unit there, but we were the best unit there. So that was part one of our two-part series on the All-Americans in Kosovo in 1999. Please check out part two, which we've released today. Thanks for listening. We'd ask you to leave a rating and a review for our podcast on iTunes, as these help others find the program. We want to thank all the paratroopers, reporters, and historians who gave voice to this moment in our history. We also want to thank Josh Harrison with Premier Companies who did the production for these two episodes.